Thanks for coming. Uh, tonight, I'm going to I'm going to talk to you about really, and I guess the reason why this talk might be exciting is that uh, this is how we do things at ISIC. We write production code and do it in this exact way, uh, more or less. Uh, but the, the concepts that we use uh, is, is there, and, and you can take these concepts once you've learned them and go and write really kick-ass functional code that does a lot of cool things. Uh, but first, a little about me, me and ISIC. I'm the dev team manager uh, at ISIC Communications. Sean works with us as well. Uh, uh, and what we do is we, we build some really cool uh, enterprise grade networks, uh, kind of have a national footprint, and we build data centers, and we do cloud infrastructure as well. And to do that, we have lots of distributed APIs all over the place, and some written on less than ideal vendor APIs that are, 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 tr are troublesome at best. Uh, and we're a team of three. We're not a big team, uh, and we're looking after a very diverse and ever-growing feature set. Uh, and to get this done, we, we love Haskell. The, just the types and the pure functional programming help keep us sane and keep us managing this chaos of the world around us. Uh, and to do this, uh, the, the, the main takeaway points for us is that we, we use the types to code all of our assumptions in the type system. So then we can come to this code six months later and actually just read the types and, and figure out what it's doing. We know how it can fail. We know what, it's, what side effects it's happening. We know what configuration it needs just by the type alone. Uh, and we've got, had some really cool stories of how we can just do refactors the night before we want to release stuff without fear, just because the compiler helps us so much and helps us reason about things. Uh, and it's allowed us to move so much faster than our Java and Perl days. It's just crazy what we can get done now with Haskell, which I find really cool and really exciting for all the stuff that I'm talking about. So the goal of the talk, uh, really, it's to help everybody understand what the hell I talk about when I talk about these kind of things, and really make the jump from FP and small, sort of doing the Yorgi lectures and writing your little functions, to actually writing a big non-trivial app with layers and configuration and errors and all that kind of stuff. I just went and talked about all that. Uh, so often that involves having some kind of configuration, catching exceptions as soon as you possibly can, because in Haskell, exceptions are completely bad juju and you do not want them in your code uh, if you're going to maintain this code and keep it running every day. Uh, just the absence of stack traces alone are enough to uh, uh, run away from that as fast as you can. Uh, and as I talked about before, we, we like to represent all the failure modes of our applications in the type so we can reason about them. But to do this, you quickly do dive down a rabbit hole of really weird things like monad transformers and these weird type classes, monad reader, and it gets a bit crazy. Especially if you're at the point where you're just understanding monads, this stuff can, can be overwhelming. Uh, but hopefully, through this talk, I, I can demystify this a little bit and kind of give a motivation for why we're at the place that we are now. Uh, and I guess the, another important thing is that we're only going to go through concepts. Uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to in this talk. I'm not going to try and present a lot of heavy code and show you exactly how it works. The code samples are going to be a bit hand wavy. Uh, but afterwards, I'm going to supply. There is a sample application up on GitHub that will show you these things in a nice multi-layered fashion. And it's it's how you would write this code if you were going to start a new Haskell app from the ground up, and you feel you can feel completely free to steal that. And I know Chris is probably planning to do that because he's been asking about that for a while. Um, but I guess the main point is don't worry if it doesn't sink in uh, completely, especially if you're in the still learning stuff from the Yogi Monad lecture. Don't worry about it. Just these things always sink in bit by bit. So just kind of uh, uh, take in what you can and we, you can learn with the code offline. Uh, I guess the final thing to color off before we jump into the meat of it is that I'm going to assume that you kind of know your way around Haskell syntax, type classes, monads, given that we just had the Yorgi lecture, though you don't need to completely understand them, and just how either works. Uh, and if you don't, if you find that this is getting in the road of your understanding what the hell's going on up here, just put your hand up and we'll try and clear it off. Uh, and explicitly don't. Don't be put off by the first chapters. I, I explicitly start at a level of abstraction that's quite unsound and annoying, uh, so that we can actually see why we have these things and make those logical jumps. So relax, sit back, and just enjoy the show. Uh, you'll learn all this stuff in time. Don't be too afraid if it doesn't all sink in. So 
we've we when running is that too small? Is that can you move it? Uh yeah, I I had a problem where this is probably the biggest that I can get it. Uh is is that okay enough or should I really spend some time on fixing it right now? That's okay? Sorry. Uh reveal JS is awesome until you run it on a big TV and then it's not so fun. Uh, but uh, you'll get you'll get into your Haskell programming where you have something like read file, where you can give it a file path and get back the string of the file inside it. But really, this can fail, and while looking at the single read file function, it's easy to say, oh, well, the file might not be there. We may have forgotten our bads, as it were. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, we get this ugly exception. But this is, this is completely unacceptable to how we do things at IC, because this failure is completely invisible in our types. We can't look at the type of this function and know that it fails. Other than that it's in this I.O. thing, so exceptions abound. But uh, really we want to look at that type and know how it can fail. So we can do better than this. And normally our first attempt with this is to kind of wrap, put an eater inside our I.O. action so that we can represent the failure inside it. Uh, and to do that, we'll do our mapping, we'll use our fmap over the result of the I.O. action and put a write on the successful uh, result. Otherwise, we that looks okay. Yeah, cool. Uh, we catch our exception and then wrap that up in the left, and that does what we expect. If we run that on a file that isn't there, we get back a left of our exception. Otherwise, we get the right stuff, uh, and we can progress on to the next step in our program. Um, but then, what happens if we we need to do another I/O action as a as a result? Oh, actually, sorry, taking a step too far. Uh, for, first thing is what, what happens now if we have to do some kind of transformation of that string inside our, inside our I.O. action. So we know we have an I.O. context up here, so to get inside that and transform a value we have to fmap. And then we have to get inside our eater, so we fmap again, and then we eventually call our length function. Uh, and that does what we expect. If we call that on our file that exists, we get our 5, otherwise we get our left of our exception. So it's doing the whole shortcutting of if our exception happens, we don't progress on to this transformation, we just quit out and it returns our left. That's all pretty much there, cool. Uh, but this gets worse. So say if we, if we want to do some kind of action based on the result of our I.O. either, uh, and write a function that will safely print the file or return left if it couldn't, it had some kind of exception. Well, to unwrap the I.O. and to have a new I.O. step after that, we know we need to bind, so we'll bind. Uh, and then we get to the point where we need a function from either I.O. exception string to I.O. of either I.O. exception unit. Magic in aside, this is a separate talk, there's a function called traverse that will do this. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in another talk. But then we get to a point where all we need is a string to I.O. and we know put string line will do that for us. Uh, and that does what we expect. We get our nice failure uh, of when the file's not there, otherwise it'll print stuff out and return our write of unit to say that our computation succeeded even though we don't have a value for it. But really, we get into a situation here where we've got far too many layers. Every step of our computation, we have to unwrap things twice. Uh, and that gets ugly really quickly, especially if we wanted to add another layer on there. We might not just want to fail, we might want to wire some configuration through there or something. So this quickly doesn't scale and gets really ugly. So this is where we bring in the big scary word of monad transformers. And really, it's not really scary at all. Really, it, a monad transformer just gives us a way to take two, mona, two monads and stack them together as one thing. So you have a single bind at each step. Uh, and this transformer itself has a, has a monad instance, so we can bind on it. And the, each one of those binds does that juggling that we were seeing before. So the juggling of the either and the IO, it does that juggling at each step. Uh, now, unfortunately, there's no way to do these in general with monads. And I'll leave that up to an exercise if you want to try that yourself. But there is no, there's no way in general to just say, I'm going to make a generic monad transformer and have it work it for any two M's. Because you need some kind of you need some information about the M to pull it apart and do the juggling. Uh, that's my easiest way to hand wave that. Uh, so there's, there's, essentially, you'll find a monad, you'll find a transformer instance for pretty much any monad except for I/O of the basic things that are transformers at least, uh, because there's no way to pull apart I/O if you use unsafe perform I/O. You'll quickly 
couple of bugs. Uh, so really, uh, a monotransformer follows the basic pattern. We have a constructor where we kind of take our, our, our nested monad and turn it into the transformer version. Uh, simplicity. Uh, and we have a thing that is called a run XT method where we take our transformer version, appeal those layers off, and give back what we started with. Uh, and the monad instance for that lets us to bind it all together and do nice things. This will all make a little bit more sense once we still see real things. Uh, so we're going to introduce E to T, which is basically what we started off with just in the transformer version. So instead of having our nested IO E to thingy, we just Ooh, don't kick that. <laughs> uh, we just have a stack where we have our either T sitting on top and IO, and then that's just one big block. We don't have this nesting anymore, so each bind is just, there's just a single bind at each step. Uh, and we have a constructor, as we saw before, which if we specialize to IO and fill that M in for IO, uh, it's what we were seeing before, and we have our run to go back to our original stack monads. So this works how you'd expect. I know what you're feeling. Yeah, sorry. It's a bit. Is that? Yeah, no, no, it's fine. Um, this one's so much easier to point to. I understand why you favour <laughs> this side so much now. Uh, so, if we if we need to do a if we need to do something that fails, we make our left hand side of our monad as uh, the the failure called busted, uh, and then we try and do a next step, which is putting the the string inside our context. Uh, and that does what we expect. We only have a single bind, but because our first step in the computation failed, we get that failure. It doesn't go on to the next step. But if we run it with something that is succeeded, which is our right-hand side of the E to inside it, wrapping it up into E to T, and then go ahead and try and put string line on there, we get hello world printed, and now right, showing that we were successful. But this kind of sucks, right? Like the this thing here is a bit ugly because really all we're saying, we just want a string inside our context. Why isn't there an easier way to do that? And these things here are a bit ugly too because this is our lifting of our IO action up into our E to T, which is really pretty ugly and we should be able to do better than this. And immediately we can, for any value that's a pure value inside of our context, we can use applicative pure. Uh, as we talked about in the previous to all pure and return are the same, so we just take our pure value and lift it up into our E to T context so that further steps can do it. Uh, we still have this problem here of our lifting our, our action from the context below up into our E to T, but we'll, we'll deal with that at a later step. Stop getting ahead of myself. Cool. Uh, so this is, this is what we had before that was ugly, right? It was our E to T for F map right, so it's basically saying I need to take the context below, wrap it up in a right, and then wrap it up in the unity above. And we have a generalized function for this in the transformers library, and it's called lift. Uh, and if you squint your eyes, you can see the same pattern here. Uh, so it's basically saying that we can take any MA for something that we have a monad trans of T and an instance of monad of M, and we can lift it up into that layer above, uh, which there is an instance for this already uh, defined over E to T, which is pretty much exactly what we had before, just with lift M instead of F map. Uh, cool. So if we go back to our previous example, we can tidy this up by taking these E to T F map rights and just putting lift there. Uh, cool. Uh, but in this case, there is a there's a sp because I/O can only ever be at the base of the stack because you can't pull apart I/O. The runtime is the only thing that should be able to do that. Uh, the the I there is a special class for saying if I/O is anywhere in the, is at the base of the stack, then you can just lift. Uh, I don't actually have it there. It's called lift I/O, and lift I/O will lift that I/O context into your stack, no matter how many layers there are. Uh, cool. And have it here. So here is our pure hello world, and we're just pushing that over to put the string line with our run EDT. Cool. So what does this mean? Uh, we've kind of we've we've replaced those nested monads with our transformer stack, and it really means that we can get that effect of having IO and either and the way to the this failure mode, uh, while still only having a single bind per step and not having to do all that juggling because the transformer is handling that for us. But uh, 
Cool. Uh, but really, the, the problem that we have now is that that lifting is a pain. So every t every layer that we have in our stack, and there can be more than two 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 bits in the stack. We have to explicitly call lift to get the action from below to go to the next one to go to the next one, and that's a real pain if you if you want to write your code in such a way that you don't want to care about the layers. You want to be able to add a layer at any point, and then not have to add another lift at every part of your code because that's that's really crazy. Uh, so we want to get rid of that. Uh, but first, we'll, we'll we'll jump on to just learning another mono transform, which is called read uh, and. I get, I'm sure everybody in their Haskell experience has probably written something like this, where you have a common thing that you, each part of the computation needs, and you're threading it through all the different sub-steps of there. And this, this gets even worse when you have sub-steps that don't even use that, that configuration, but they need to take it just by virtue of having to give it to layers below. Uh, that gets really ugly really quickly, and it's... It, it's almost it, it's almost something that uh, discourages abstraction and refactoring because you have to pass this damn connection around so much. So there is a way to solve this, and it's with read t. And I guess basically you can if you if you need an analogy for read t, it's a it's a thing that is waiting for a bit of configuration, and when it gets that configuration, it returns the action below. So it's a it's a step of your computation that's it needs that configuration to do its work, and once it has it, it will produce that value for it. Uh, and the cool thing about the bind, the bind of read to t is that it composes all those little functions of things that are waiting for a configuration to produce an action, and wires all those together so you don't have to do that. And the result of that is just one big thing that is after a configuration and will return you your result. So the cool thing about this is that you can transform code like this and remove this explicit connection here to just be a read a t of connection IO, which means that each one of these steps now has to be a read a t, which we haven't lost the ability that we we haven't lost the ability to see in our type that our computation depends on the connection, but we've removed the need to explicitly pass it down the layers. Uh, which is really cool because you can remove all of those connections and when you get down to these layers that don't need it, you don't need to mention it at all, because the, the sub-action of this action here is another read a t, and all these things will flow down uh, by virtue of how the read a t works. Uh, and then and the nice thing about this is that we only have to care about that connection when we're actually doing a query. So if we have this, fun if we have this function here which eventually takes the connection, we can just wrap our thing that is going to do our IO action of the step below uh, and just wrap it up in a read a t and make these things happen. That's still a bit ugly. There's still better ways to do this, but we just explain the concepts here. Uh, and of course, there is our run read a t function, which is just taking our action that is waiting for our configuration to produce our MA and giving it that configuration so that it can produce the result for you. Uh, and this does what we pretty much expect. If we make a program here, which has two steps in it, where uh, we, our first step just puts the configuration directly, and our second step uppercases that configuration, and in this case, the configuration is a string, uh, then, and we run it, we will get the put string line of the uh, string that we put in there, and we'll get the uppercase version as well. Um, cool. So. Uh, we've gotten to the point where we kind of know what read a t is. It's, it's, it's something that we can stack on top of our stack, because so, we can stack it on any monad or monad transformer, uh, and it can, give that, it can give the ability for that stack to need, have access to that configuration at each step of the way. Uh, but it hides, a, it hides away that configuration passing so that we don't actually have to care about it until we need to use it. Uh, and at the end, we just we run it and pull that apart when we actually need to get at the value that we need. Cool. Uh, any questions at this point? Because I'm going through it really quickly. Uh, so if I'm going to it too, through it too quickly, let me know. Actually, a little bit. You said like monad stack. So just assume that that stack just blows apart if you have an error at any point, right? Uh, what do you mean blow apart? Like say, like if you're trying to read that file and it's not there, it's just going to stop right then, right? Yes, the steps, the further steps don't happen because the e to t stack, basically at every step of the way, it's pulling it apart and saying, is my thing inside left 
Well, if it is, then I don't need to do anything because there's no possible sub-step that I can do. So. If you want to have like three or four steps and you want to do like something different if it gets to like step three. Yep. Is, this, is that getting too difficult? To well, but you mean based on whether there's an error or not? Yeah, whether there's error or not. It's completely possible. Okay. Uh, and there is a function called catch uh, error in Monet, cap, uh, Monet error that will allow you to do this. Oh, cool. So. <laughs> Uh, cool. Uh, anything more? Yeah. Yeah. Why doesn't do query have the type of reader to? Uh, I could, was back before that month. It could have been a mistake. Oh no no because no, this is the thing that's this is the thing that's doing our I/O thing. It could. Why doesn't it? It still could be reader to. It? Yeah, it still could. I was just kind of trying to make the example that. All the reader T is is something that's after that connection and produces the I/O action. Oh, exactly. like below. Yeah. Should be reader T's all the way down. Well, well at some point you eventually you need the thing doing the I/O action, and this is trying to demonstrate that. Oh. <laughs> I never get down to that. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't exist. Do you, do you put reader T's all the way down? No, I just wish for it. Yeah. Here I am. You use like a custom. I mean, we'll get to we'll get to it we'll get to it soon. I mean, really, that thing is probably a read T where you ask for the configuration and not actually construct the read T like that. Well, so. usually what happens is do query is some other API that someone else wrote, and so I have to go. Why didn't they use read a T? And then I have to start yeah. passing stuff around. Yeah. So sorry if that was confusing in that sense, but this is just kind of saying this is an action at the layer below. This is the I/O that needs the connection to do its job, and we're packaging that up in reader T to say that this is now not this, well, it's still this function, but it's now in the reader T context, and it can be composed with other reader Ts to join all that magic together. Abstract, not magic. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> cool. Uh, sweet. So we're at the point where we, we, I mean, that's all cool and all, but really we want to get to a point where we're actually building an application um, and to, with, with, when we're building an application, at least with the code that I write uh, every day, uh, day to day, we kind of get to the point where we need some, a back-end thing, and that back-end thing is going to need side effects config in a way to fail, without exceptions. Uh, big thing. Uh, so we, we end up writing a, a data type that kind of looks like this. Uh, it will change in a little bit, but... So we have our application thing, so that's our context that we're going to do all our work. Uh, and this application context has the ability to fail with this error message, and it has some kind of configuration, and it has IO on the base of it, because we're going to need to do a DB query or something like that. Is there a type? There can't be a type error in that. No, I didn't say that. The <laughs> simplest thing, but I guarantee you I didn't say type error. OK, cool. I said something else. I think you took exception to the idea of an error You're message. You're reading me wrong. <laughs> I said profunctor. Happy is a profunctor. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a that's a that's a later talk. <laughs> sure. Alright, cool. So yeah, sorry. We have our EDT, we have our ReDC with our configuration, we have IO on the base. <clears throat> Do all these animations and waste them because I talk ahead of myself. Uh, but for reasons uh, of the 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 monad the the uh, oh. sorry. Uh, for reasons that we'll explain later, we're not going to use either T, we're going to use except T. But for all purposes, it's exactly the same as what we uh, explained before. There's just a handy instance that makes it useful for what we want to do. Uh, so to get into this, uh, we're going to fill in our error type first. So we, 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 we're, our application can fail with two different things. Uh, we can either have a DB SQL exception with the error message that it returned, or we can have this funny thing where foo is missing, for whatever reason. At some point in our computation, we can be missing our foo, and uh, we want to report that as an error. Uh, so we, we remove our e uh, type parameter here, and we fill that in, uh, further specializing our application type. Uh, and then we want to make some kind of environment. So if we were looking at our example before, uh, we have that, all that database stuff needs a, a connection to do its job. Uh, so we fill that into the reader slot. And now we have our app A, which is something that is of kind star to star, which means that we can have a monad. And thankfully, GHC has this wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, extension called Generalized New Type Deriving, which can generate you all these instances over this data type for free. You don't have to do any work, which is great. Uh, 
Do you particularly hate that, given that it's right. um, auto-generating magic? Sometimes uh, it generates not the one that I want. Uh, I'm not at that level. So. But. So, and, and, and I just have a little bit of distrust. So I, just okay. don't, I don't hate it. Yeah. Well, I, we use this in all of our application things at work, and it hasn't caused us problems. Sure. Excellent. Uh, so we, we generate all these instances. We're familiar already with Funk Replicative and Monad. Uh, we've seen Monad IO for our Lyft IO, and we'll get on to talking about what Monad Reader and Monad are. Uh, last but not least, we've got a bit of housekeeping. Every Monad Transformer thingy has some kind of run thing to give it what it needs to do its job and pit it <coughs> into the, the actions below. And this is no exception. It's just peeling off our new type here, running the reader with the configuration, and peeling off the, either, the accept key, uh, and returning our either inside our IO action. Um, cool. So now we'll actually talk about what the hell monad reader is. So it's a, it's a type class that says for any M, regardless of how the stack is, or whatever parts it has inside it, you can ask that M for a value. You can ask that M for its configuration. So if you call ask, you will get back a, an M, your context, with the R inside it, or you have this handy function called us, uh, which takes the configuration and transforms it to something else. The reason why you could use that is for, uh, say, your, like before, our configuration is a record. You might use the record accessor to pull out the exact thing that you want in the configuration rather than doing an F map or something like that. It's just a shortcut. Uh, and we use that like so. So if we, if we make our reader T context here with just asking for the current configuration value and storing it into R, and asking for the uppercase version, uh, and then returning the tuple of those two things, we get a result much like we saw before, where we've uppercase the configuration in one and left it alone in the other. Yep. Is ask and R. Oh, R ask and asks both part of the definition of monad reader? Like are they members of the class or is only ask uh, the class? I thought, it, I had a weird thing where I thought both of them were in there. Okay. But, that, sorry? sorry? Yeah. Why? Because I don't think it has a super type of functor. I thought there was some ah, there that you couldn't actually yeah, implement okay. it through historical mistakes. Yes. Uh, I thought that was why. Okay. And there's also local, which allows you to change the configuration and put a different configuration down some part of the tree of your computation. But you don't, that's crazy stuff. You really you only need to <coughs> consider these two while you're still learning. Cool. Uh, and then we have monad error. So this does the same thing. It, it says, for regardless of the shape of what M is, I've got a way to throw the error, uh, so take my error and just return our M context uh, with the error inside it. Uh, otherwise, I have catch error, which can take my MA, and then this is the this is the thing we were talking about before, where we can take our context and a, a, a value of that context, uh, and then put in a function that will take catch the error and transform it to a new value in our context. So we could use that to say catch the error of this thing, and then recover with this function. So we could do a, we might just throw the error again with something transformed, or we might uh, recover somehow and print the error to a something, or, and I think that's what, ah, oh, sweet. Again, I should look at the future slides. Uh, so, and this works just like this, so if we throw our error in our accept t context, we'll get back our left of the error message that we threw. But in this case, where we have our context where we've, we've, we've got a failure, and we run catch error on it, we'll get that failure here in this E, be able to do something with it, and then return another value in that context, where here we've just kind of ignored the error, printed it, and said, it's all good. You don't need that error. <coughs> Does that make sense? Cool. Cool. And now we get into a really cool spot. Uh, and, ah, sweet the do query that is all in our application context now. Uh, so now, now we can just, now we have a way to just say at any point that this app 
uh, I, I can ask that context what the what the configuration is and get back my connection. Uh, and then we're doing this silly thing that uh, we it's abstracted away in the real code. Unfortunately, there's no code in the library that will just do this for you nicely. At the moment, I want to fix control error to help out with this stuff because it's a bit sad not having it. But this is the same thing we saw before. We we're wrapping that I, this action into a IO either and then lifting it up into our context and then saying if that either that we got out of it was a failure, just throw it with our monad error instance. And then that at that point gets rid of that either and allows us to progress on our way of uh, just returning our ABA that we got back from ah, the query. It's a bit hand waved. That's fine. Uh, cool. Uh, uh, so then we move on to, to building up on these blocks. We, we want to make something like load person, where it, we want to take the ID of a person and return a, a maybe of that person and the address they have. But we want to do something a little bit funky, so we might find that person, and if we don't find that person, we just want to return nothing. So we, we grab out our maybe of that person that we could have found from the database, uh, and then we do a... We, map over that, uh, that maybe and say, if, the, if that maybe was there, let's go find the address. Uh, and it, but if we can't find that address, then we, we want to crash here. We, 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 well, not crash, but we want to denote in our return type that we couldn't find this person's address and give back a nice error. Because we don't want to return a maybe person, maybe address. That's just crazy. We don't want to have to deal with that in that code. And this kind of thing helps you out a lot, right? Because Instead of just having the world of nullables that you can in Java or Perl or anything like that, you can really say with absolute certainty that you're going to get these two things out or it's going to fail at this point, which we find particularly cool. Uh, cool. I'm not going to say anything about that. Cool. So really, we're at the point where we've kind of we've melded our entire stack into one thing to really hide all the details. And we've hidden it so much with all these type classes that we've derived, the monad error, the monad reader, and the monad IO, that we completely don't have to care about the layers in that thing anymore. We can add another layer to that, and because of those type classes, and because we're only calling those type classes, our code's not going to care. Uh, which is really cool, and we really get to that point where we finally have that nice thing that can fail, can take configuration, and it's just complete magic underneath, at least to our code. Um, so yay, that's awesome. Um, but really, I mean, we, we get to a point where in a non-trivial app, you're going to have more than one backend. You're going to have a DB, you're going to have an upstream API that's constantly failing. Or if you're lucky, you're going to be able to have a nice, beautiful logic layer that doesn't have any side effects underneath it. And in that case, you only want your errors and configs, uh, and this beautiful, pristine thing can just be magical and never throw exceptions. It's great. Uh, but you're, gonna, you're probably going to have more, more than one of these things in your application. Uh, so to, and you, you're gonna, you want to be able to write these things separately so that you can test and reason about them separately. But then you get into a problem where how do I, how do I glue these together? And there's, like monad transformers themselves, there's no real magic for this. Uh, so we have our two things, we have our DB layer and we have our logic layer. As said before, our logic layer doesn't have IO at the bottom, so we just use the non-transform version of reader and just have a pure reader underneath. Uh, we have our two run functions. So wrapping this up, we, we, we want to make an application context which binds these two contexts together. And we, we combine these things together by combining the configurations with product types and saying that our environment is both the DB environment and the logic environment. And we combine our errors with some types to say, hey, in each step of the way, an application can fail either with a DB error or a logic error. Uh, and then we have all the usual fanfare. Uh, and then really to, to the, the, only, the only real way, and you might tell me that this is wrong, but because, because you really need to know about all the layers, of your layer beneath, there's no real way to lift it up to this application layer without pulling it all apart and repackaging it. And this is what this does. So it will ask for the, the logic uh, thingo from the uh, environment, 
and then run our logic layer, and then wrapping it up by throwing the app logic error if we, that computation failed in some way. I mean, that in general is a monad morphism, right? But there's no way to, sorry, you were <laughs> looking at the slides, but. I'm thinking. Yeah. But that, that in general is a monad morphism, but there's no way to, to generically create that. You mean like from F of A to G of A? Yeah, to automate that. Much like there's no way to magically make a monad transformer that composes monads together for oh, free. Yeah, no, just not, not in general. Yeah. Cool. So you have to do this layer. It's okay. You only have to do this at one spot. Uh, and then basically wherever you... I don't... Oh, what it is? I should have had someone that actually pulled that up at that. It'll be in the sample code. But basically that th with this function you can take any logic context and call your lift logic in before it and do the same thing as we do with lift IO or lift. Just pulling it up to that layer above. Cool. So takeaway points. Nested monads suck. You don't. There's some times where you you just you probably deal with this in a localized point in your code, but you don't want this pervasive through your entire code base because you don't want to have that nested binds at every step of the way. Monad transformers give us a way to stack the, the monads on top of each other so that we can have a single thing that has the features of both and only one bind per step, so we don't have to deal with that juggling. But the transformers themselves don't really solve the problem entirely, because uh, they really only solve the problem at the at the bind point. They give you a bind that does the juggling, but you to construct the actual transformer value yourself, you have to do a lot of lifting, and that part of the code needs knowledge about what the stack is to be able to do that lifting. So that kind of sucks. But the MTL, the classes that we find in MTL, like Monad Reader, Monad Error, Monad IO remove your ability to have to care about what that stack is. Uh, so we can, the parts in the code where we're actually using these contexts, we don't have to care about the layers anymore, which gets us into a really good spot. Cool, uh, and we talked about that. Our accept team on an error gives us a way to throw and catch errors, and the reader gives us a way to thread a config through, and not have to care about that config until we really need it. Um, and as we talked about just before, we, we can write out these things as separate things that we can test and reason about in individual bits and do manual lift functions to unwrap the layers below and bring it up. Cool. So there's some further ideas uh, that are worth mentioning, but I don't really want to talk for an hour and a half and lose everybody in the process. But if you're really going to take this, if you're really going to take these ideas to the to the level that you want to be writing production code in it, you probably should look at things like control the error. Uh, it's a really good package for defining lots of common errors for just catching exceptions and dealing with going from maybes to eithers in nice ways that kind of say, well, I have this maybe, and if it's not there, uh, throw this either t value or something like that. There's a really, lot of really cool stuff in there, and it re-exports all of safe so that you can have all the functions that aren't going to crash. So it has head maybe and... Uh, tail maybe and all those kind of things that aren't going to throw exceptions because the, the real problem with exceptions in Haskell is that you can only catch them in IO so you really the, the exceptions that you get out of things like head are terabat evil like because you have to jump into IO to be able to catch those and get those out of the way so you really really don't want those so the package like safe which control error exports are really really handy for you to be able to write code that just doesn't crash uh, data validation uh, has some really cool stuff in it for the ACK validation uh, type. Has a way to, it, it doesn't have a monad instance, so it only has applicative, so you can use it for going through a whole heap of validation contextual steps uh, and grabbing all the error messages that happen rather than doing what either does and crashing or, or stopping on the first step. So you can use that to validate a form and get back everything that fails rather than just the first failure which is really useful for a lot of cases. And it really seems like you're trying to take that package to subsume E to T and everything. So that sounds really cool. Yeah. So Tony and I work yeah. on that package with a couple of others. Yeah. And that hopefully gets folded back towards some of the other things. Yeah. Because a lot of data.validation seems to be the only place where error accumulation exists in yeah. the libraries, which is very surprising to me. 
Well, there's there's like, a new um, e thing in da either. Yeah, that yeah. Does that? But yeah, with like a quarter of the instances or something. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. So um. Anyway, it's that's cool. So if really you want cool. to ask about that at the pub afterwards, yeah, I'll copy it up. Yeah. Really cool for just doing things in a slightly different way. Because it's in applicative, there's obviously no transformer instance there, but you can get around that and still produce nice error messages. Uh, controller lens, completely separate talk. Can't really talk about it very much here, but the I do use it in the sample code for the 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 reason why controller lens is really cool is that the concept of a prism, which I guess uh, it's a thing to do pattern matching in a nice composable way, uh, and you can but you can use it to make the layers of your errors go away and really map down them in a nice nice way that doesn't involve pattern matching at each of the steps. Uh, so you can use the prism to go from your uh, application DB error to something into a branch inside your DB error and kind of unravel all those layers in really nice ways. Uh, can't talk about that anymore, but have a look at it. It's awesome. And you'll want to use it to if you really get into the Haskell production mode kind of thing. Uh, and don't forget about Scala. All this is, it is possible in Scala. Uh, the Scala Z library does a really good job of making this stuff possible in Scala, even though Scala tends to fight it at every step of the way. Um, I don't have sample code in Scala, unfortunately, but if there are enough people that are particularly interested in it, I've, we've done all these ideas in production Scala code. So if, pe if there's enough people that ask me for it and are keen on it, then I will do it. I just didn't get time to do it for tonight. Um, so come chat to me over a beer or send me an email if, you, if you're interested in that kind of thing. But it's all possible, there's just the way that the inference works, the type classes aren't so magical and you end up kind of having to care more about the stack uh, and piecing it all together yourself. Uh, there's some further reading which is really useful. Uh, the two chapters on real world Haskell is probably the only place that actually talks about it. Uh, Mono transformers at the very least. Uh, and there's a chapter on error handling as well. Um, the MTL docs and the transformer docs uh, on package will tell you about other transformers that we haven't talked about. Uh, so there are transformers for writing, so you can write out a log at every step of your computation, and there's also state T, which allows you to have a mutable variable at each part of the step. It's not really mutable, but you can grab the previous value and send the changed value onto the next step to do safe mutation across your computations. Uh, and the, all the source code and the, if you're really interested in looking at the reveal.js source code, it's on there too, <laughs> but probably not. Uh, the, the code's up there. Uh, you should just, I'll have to fill out a readme tonight to tell you how to get it running, but uh, there'll just be a Postgres DB set up and a few things and it'll all work for you. It's, the basic gist of that is and it'll be in the readme, but it's just it's parsing the CSV that I get out of my internet banking and inserting it all into a database. So there's parsing that fails, there's obviously DB calls that fail. And it's just an example of how I would write a little app like this, uh, for better or worse. And the slides, they're not up there yet, but they'll be up on my website later on tonight. Cool, I think that's it. Thanks everybody for listening. Are there any questions? <laughs> yep. But why don't the IO functions in, in the prelude that can fail mm -hmm. just return a, you know, error E, A, where E is some, some type of all errors that can happen when you're in the IO mode? I don't know. Be it, you know, yeah, problem, be it, be it, you forgot your badge, the file's not there, or like you're out of memory. I don't know, I think something would, there's some part of historical mistakes there, but I think some people generally find it easier to deal with the exceptions than encode things in their type, which I think is pretty crazy, like, because, and you see that in things like uh, network.rec and uh, HTTP client, where they'll, they'll openly throw exceptions to you, and just, you have to do your best to contain all those things as soon as possible, so that you can reason about your code. Has anyone ever experimented with an alternative value that doesn't throw exceptions anywhere? Ah, uh, well, I mean, certainly that's possible with all the partial fun the partial functions. They can just disappear. They're not necessary. Just but, use sorry? Just, just use safe. Yeah, well, I mean, even, even for I.O., like, you know, if you, know, you, if you try to resolve a host name and, then, you know, you, there's no resolution, you, I, it's going to throw an exception. So, yeah, I mean... Well, like, why isn't there a sun type for that? 
And has anyone experimented with the with the version of the Spoon does do that. Spoon does do that. It, does it like uses that. unsafe perform IO and it uses uh, NF data to completely make your entire data structure strict as well to completely get rid of all exceptions. Because I guess the, the takeaway point from that is that because Haskell's lazy, if you haven't evaluated the entire structure yet, an exception could be lurking all the way off to this part of the tree of computation. So it's particularly evil for you to say this computation has absolutely no exceptions at any point of the step way. You either need to completely remove all the laziness and evaluate the entire structure and catch the exceptions, or you need to be able to code in a way that you can say there's no exceptions there. And that's the way that we go because we just wrap everything up in these either T's and whatnot so that we, we're explicit about that. And we know we don't have to worry about all that kind of stuff to make it happen. Stack traces in 710. Are the stack traces still based on the profiling cost centers? Uh, I think they're based on the partial warp information that's coming in 710. So they're okay. available now based on profiling in 710. They're, they're not available to me because as soon as you hit template Haskell, profiling's out. And most snap apps have a template Haskell wrapper around the main function. So yeah. I don't know screwed. how more stuff's going to go with the template Haskell either. But yeah. I think it's going to be later. Oh, okay. I think dwarf comes oh, in right. 710 and then yeah. the next one will be. There's a partial dwarf. Is yeah. There's enough yeah. to get some info. I'm not sure it's actually on. But I might be wrong. I thought it wasn't mm -hmm. all hooked together yet. You know, in pagan languages, I can throw an exception and it will just go up the stack. Yeah. Um, and obviously, with that, you can have. You know, the either will do a similar thing and bolt the computation and mm -hmm. simulate it going back up the stack. But if I have multiple layers, each layer may have different types of errors that it can return or throw, for a better word. Yeah. yeah. Um, how do you handle that scenario? Like, say I've got a low level database error, but three layers above it, my, my failure conditions are different. Do you just make sure everything is total and you're handling all the internal conditions? How do you wrap? Um, well, that, that, that was the bit. Let me just come back. Please come back. Excellent. Catch your logic. Yeah, it's really it's it's really this guy here. So you're 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 wrapping the layers and errors up below. But okay. you may you may choose to completely ignore the DB errors and wrap them up into something else. Like you don't have to just wrap that up verbatim. It's just normally the way that it goes. Okay. So that means that the high level you need to basically kind of wrap up for each of the underlying. Yeah. Yeah. Problems. And you, you you might have you might at the app layer you might have errors that are completely unrelated to the to the errors of the sub layers. You might have a missing foo error at the end of here. So you can do all that and it's just adding to that sum type. Yeah. You can put in a type class as well. Yeah. So there's a question I get a lot. It mm -hmm. goes like this. You have functions that depend on in this case your database connection. Yep. To, to compute values. Yeah yeah. Um, and this is all well and good that you're passing your connections down. Mm -hmm. But had I taken a different approach? And instead, have like a global variable that holds my connection. This new problem that's going to come along, which is I need to now depend on something else mm -hmm. as well as my connection. I don't know, my host name, for example. I don't know where mm -hmm. I'm sending the data to. Yeah. If I take your existing code, which currently depends on connection, yeah. I have to go through all of that code and start adding the host name as well, or, or modify the stack, mm -hmm. or I just put a new variable in. Yeah, this is the way the question is presented yeah. to me. But the, the way that this works, it's actually pretty cool, right? Because this, you would just add the, the field to your DBN, and nothing else has to change. Because uh, do that end up with a bit of a god object passed through the code base? The top level, this top level M <laughs> is very much a god object, but each, each of the layers below only care about their part of the environment. So you're not, you're not saying that in the DB layer you have access to this entire environment. Uh, which is no, you, you, you zoom in. You, pull yeah, you zoom in. You, you're right. You just put it in a record in this case. So I'm yeah. going to modify the question a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> then you're just cheating. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> and, and, I, I guess, I, guess now, that, I need to modify my host name. Like I need, you know, um, my my client rang me and they need to modify the host name by clicking on the button. Oh yeah. And so it's no longer a read thing that gets read. It's modifiable thing. Yeah. So now you have to go and change all your readers to states. Yeah. Um, and, and look, I can keep going with this question and, until eventually you go, right, screw it, I'm going to have a variable. Not, but, that you, not that that's the correct answer. But, but but my this answer is the that, way that the question is posed to me. Yeah, but my answer to that is that once you've got to that point, you've lost because you've, you've lost that ability to say, hey, I look at this thing and I know exactly what that context does. 
We did this for a reason. We want to be able to look at our code 12 months later when we haven't touched this code at all and look at it and go, oh yeah, I don't want to have to care about this variable off to the side. Even though that might make it easier to, for you to add this feature, if we make the structure of our computation reflect exactly what we're assuming is going to go on, we're going to have a much easier time. So when it, when it comes time to change it though, I've got a lot of work to do. Um, if I hadn't used the variable, then I don't. Yeah, but if, if, you, if you cheat and use the variable, then you just have a lot of work to do 12 months down the track when you have to understand the damn thing. Mm -hmm. And I, I prefer to make writing code harder than reading code. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll tell you my answer to this question, if you like. Yeah, go for it. So um, the answer to the question alludes to your monad reader and monad state and so on. Yeah. Whereby you don't construct your programs whereby you are in, you know, explicitly reading the connection. You just say any kind of stack such that I could read a connection. Yeah. And that way, all the parts of your program that only depend on the reading of a connection yeah. will have will continue to work. And the parts that now have to do the modifications, they're the only parts that you're going to have to change. Yeah. So it'll go from monad reader to monad state, for example. And yeah. Probably exactly the parts that you need to look at anyway. To make sure yeah. You yeah. So the, the work that you, the goal that you want to get to is the work that you need to do is nothing more than is inherent to the problem that yeah, you've got. Yeah, you were going to have to change those things anyway. Um, I, I, what I don't want to do is the need to change something propagates from the whole program. Yeah. So really, I, just, I, I want to limit my necessary changes to be the size of my problem that I've got, yeah. which is to click a button and make it change whatever it is. Yeah. I think if you took some of the type and the type signatures off your functions, that would be more general, right? The ones where you're doing ask the stuff. ask and the throw errors. Yeah, definitely. So definitely. they're actually functions. That and in the, in the sample code I do, uh, it's just once you get to the point where you have every like the when you when you're jumping between layers, it's not you, you can't rely on those things too much anymore. You kind of have to jump up and unwrap things. Oh, actually, no, you don't. Yeah, I think the only reason why sometimes I don't do that is because sometimes it gets a bit unwieldy. And if I know it's the entire thing, then I'll just write db, uh, which is sometimes bad, which you shouldn't do. That's okay. uh, but yes, yeah, you could, you could definitely, and I might have, actually, good point. There is, I've been doing this stuff using just the technique of programming against the type, the high level type classes, not the explicit stack. Yeah. And what happens is you don't have that lift logic that takes you between two little stacks. Because you only uh, no, have one top level. I couldn't get away from that because it's because these things are different. Yep. There's no there's not a good way to yep. So I only have app I app in the app error. And yeah. in fact I don't even bother with a new type app because I only end up with the run app that will specialize it to the stack anyway. And you don't actually need those two new types because you can program your you can end up programming against components that will throw just that little bit of error and use just that little bit of reader or state, but don't explicitly mention a, a, a stack that holds them. So you never have to have a DB stack that uses those two bits. You just end up with type class constraints that reference them. Yeah. Is, is this with class events? Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, you, you, you can't, can't just do that with events oh. to do it. Oh, I don't think. I, 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 I you run into right problems. Do you need the has type classes? Yeah, sort of, yeah, you, you yeah. run into problems with functional dependencies in MPL if you try and do it purely with my reader. Because yeah. you can't have the two M's that depend that access a different part of it. Yep. Yep. Uh, so yep. this is this yep. is kind of explaining the first the the first step of understanding MTL. And if you there is a next step after that. But well I skip that step. Yeah. So I skip lift logic. Yeah. I don't know how to go between two different yeah. stacks. That's, but if you want if like you if you wanna understand how these things work. This is this is probably the first I step to understand how they work. Talk about the pump. Yeah, talk about it. Yeah. Pump. But yeah, that that's interesting because uh, certainly just with pure MTL, I've never gotten that to, to work nicely. I'm keen to know what the next step is. Oh, I'm like a convert. Excellent. Because if we uh, what's done? Uh, born again. Born again MTL user. But if we if we jump into source and then CSV, uh, and wait for GFC mod. Oh. Close this. 
Just for that wallpaper alone, if I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> hang on, hang on. I get one ski next catches up. That's bad. <laughs> uh, Stop making it transparent. Make it like black. Yeah, it's just with Emacs, it's going to be too hard. Uh, <laughs> there we go. Excellent, sorry. Cool. Yeah. Uh, let's see if I can actually not have wasted everybody's time and find an example of this. Cool Thanks, I just invented it then. Uh, something up the top, please. Uh, so yeah, th this guy here, uh, where we it's just doing a parsing of this header thing that we're after, uh, and we know that it's just we we're writing it in such a way that it's it's just saying for any context m, as long as it has to has a way to fail with CSV error, and I also need applicative because obviously I used uh, Kimla somewhere, uh, then I can do what I need to do, and that way you can care a lot m less about m, uh, and that gets you even further. And I think that's it. If there aren't any more questions. Yeah. You, did you write your own um, CSV parsing library? No, CSV I'm using Cassava. I just okay. have there's a really awful textual string in there that I have to parse, and there's some rows that aren't CSV that I have to right. parse at first. So you parsing the error string to to get the nice errors like CSV had a parsing. Oh hell no! No no no! It's just the header. <laughs> the header in the CSV isn't the CSV. It's this crazy thing that. I have to pause with Parsec. Yeah, Suncorp, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry if there's any Suncorp here. But that CSV is completely not useful if you want to automatically process it, which I quickly found out when writing this code. Uh, cool. Uh, I think that's it. Uh, you want to finish off MCUIs? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thanks, Ben.